Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Exploring Cost in Fiction, a Cyberpunk Gridlock. I'd like to welcome Simon de la Rivière to the virtual stage to begin. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, uh, wherever you are in the world. Um, so um, I'll just kick start by putting up my slides and sharing my screen. Let me just share screen quickly. Um, there we go. Okay, let's start. Okay, um, so just before I, I kick off the, the talk, um, just want to say thank you to everyone at the Radical Exchange for uh, putting on this conference. It is amazing to see all the amazing diverse set of talks. Um, the other thing as well is that uh, it's Father's Day today, and like I think like many in the world, uh, we might be in a position where we can't be with our parents. Um, and I think my dad is watching, so I just want to say <clears throat> thank you for supporting me. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> okay, so what's my talk going to be up? But first, sorry, first introduce myself. I'm Simon. Um, I've been working in the blockchain space for a few years. I've enjoyed writing a lot. Um, and that has mostly been blog posts and articles about various ideas. And a year ago, I started writing on a novel and part of it was inspired by radical markets. So this talk is going to be about detailing what this cost model looks like for a future city that is in this novel. Um, and then also just setting the tone of how we can use fiction to you know, explain concepts that might not be familiar to the world as it is at the moment. So as we all know, fiction is this tool we can use to bring forth new kinds of imaginations and sketching the way the world looks. And, you know, I think for many of us, we, we grew up reading, say, things like science fiction, um, watching things like Star Trek, and seeing how some of these things came into existence, or other sort of science fiction novels like William Gibson, Neil Stevenson, um, some of these ideas presented a future and we've sort of lived into them. And so I think it's important that we also recognize the value of fiction in telling stories. And it might not necessarily be a utopian vision. Um, it might be a dystopian vision or, must, or it could just be a vision where it just sketches the good and bad of what could happen if we adopt a certain system in our society. And what's left for the reader is just to evaluate it for themselves. And so that to me was the important part of adding concepts from radical markets into the novel. So this novel um, came to me in, I was like mid 2018 when I saw this picture from Harriton Pushbachner's visual novel called Soft City. And it had this sort of visual um, of this sort of dystopian future where it seemed like people were in this gridlock, but it felt like they were actually living in these cars. And I just love that image. Um, it, just, it just presented this interesting, interesting city. And of the, the, the stories that I've joined in the past, it's when um, the, the writers invent new cities. There is a novel called The Scar where it's just a city called Armada, which is just like ships tied to each other and it's floating in the ocean. And so that was like one of my favorite novels. So I really enjoy when people invent cities. And so this stayed with me for a very long while. And I kept inventing new parts of how the city might work. And it's during that time that I got familiar with radical markets and discovered cost. And for those most familiar is watching for the first time, cost stands for common ownership self-assessed tax. And it's a, the other sort of accepted um, verbiage is harbinger tax. And the way it works is that when you buy an asset, you always have to specify a sale price. Um, it is always on sale. And the, there's a tax attached to ownership of this asset, such that the goal that you get out of it is that um, the 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 asset prices would fluctuate closer to what society as a whole wants them to be. There's no 
capability to have what's called a holdout problem. Someone can't take an asset and keep it off the market to be productively used. Um, and it's also used in other forms. Salsa is the other one with self-assessed licensing. Um, but so I, I took this idea and I kept running with it. And after um, I, I sort of left my, my full-time job after four years, I thought this was an interesting avenue just to, to, to write, write my first novel and see where it gets me. And so I wrote a novel which is currently in revisions at this stage. It's called The Hope Runners of Gridlock. Um, so it started in 2018, started writing in June last year, uh, and hopefully I should still release it somewhere this year. Um, but the the core the, the a core part of this novel is sort of the gridlock in this novel, which runs on cost. Um, and so, what I'm going to cover for the rest of the talk is it's not going to be any spoilers to the novel. It's sort of the precursor to when the novel starts. But um, I went through a lot of exploration to figure out how to, to make this believable. And obviously in fiction, some parts of fiction is just sort of, it is an exercise left to the reader uh, to imagine how this might have happened. But because I enjoyed working in crypto economics, I wanted to ensure that it's at least believable for me. And so I, I went through a process of designing how this might have happened or how it might happen in the future, uh, given the world circumstances as it is. So what is this gridlock in this future city? Um, it, there's a, there's a, it's called the public car market and there's a gridlock of traffic and it's in stasis, it doesn't move. Um, you can buy and sell a car in this gridlock. Um, as I said before, it's always on sale. And then the taxes from these cars in this gridlock funds public infrastructure um, and over time it's gotten sort of uh, adopted emergent behavior and eventually people built homes and businesses in these cars and that's where it got like interesting and like you could really explore in depth and become imaginative um, but there's a reason why these cars are not moving and in stasis and that's sort of the the sort of origins of the gridlock or what one could say this is sort of a prequel or prologue to why the city exists today. Um, it's not told as in-depth like this in the novel. So uh, I might write like a prequel or like a addendum in the future to describe this process. But for all intents and purposes, this was just part of a fun imaginative exercise to explain how it got to the point where it is today. So this the, the origin of the gridlock starts in the near future where uh, Earth is under duress from sort of constant like superstorms due to climate change and it has caused a lot of volatility and a lot of the sort of in the a lot of spending in the world has to do with protecting earth and its cities from these sort of perfect storms that keep coming um, and one such perfect storm came to this fictional city um, when the storm came, the city ordered its citizens to evacuate. And in that process, they started leaving the city and there was only like a handful of roads leaving the city. And this is where there is a sort of a sci-fi element that might be explained in a future, future novel. But um, essentially there, the superstorm is going to come but what eventually happened is, is that the superstorm did, did actually inf affect the, the surroundings of the city, but not so much the city itself. What happened, what, what the people saw when they left in this, this sort of queue or evacuation order to leave, is that they lost contact with the rest of the world. Suddenly everything went dark and silent. And so they didn't know what was going on. So now they're suddenly stuck in this queue to leave, and they're afraid, like, what's going on? Like, we lost contact. We don't know to what extent. We can still communicate with the people in our city, but we've lost contact with the rest of the world. And <clears throat> we still lost contact with the rest of the world. What's going on? And then the storm does come and does to some extent damage the city, 
but not as bad as they thought it would. So buildings fell down, there was destruction, um, and that in turn caused the city itself to also sort of get stuck deeper into its own gridlock. People couldn't drive back to where they came from, um, but there was also this clash between people that feared that the storm might still come, they still wanted to leave, some people might still want to come back, but ultimately this, this time of chaos, this, this, this fear about what was going on. And as we know, in times of chaos and fear, there's always this opportune moment for market capture. <laughs> and so there was this endeavoring businessman uh, that saw what was happening and he decided much like a war bond where uh, if you buy a war bond and the one side wins the war, you win. If you lose, you lose everything anyway. So what this person decided to do was to say, look, I am just going to be, to me, a good person and buy some of these cars from the people that want to leave this gridlock, right? So they, they're stuck in it, but they, they have all their belongings with them. There's nothing left, but they just want to go home, but they can't. And so what this businessman did is say, hold on, I'm going to give you money to leave, but I want to buy a car. And what this businessman imagined was if the city would survive, you just have a lot of cars. You can now go sell back into the market. And as this happened, more and more people started seeing what was going on. And more people also did the same as this businessman, buying up different cars in this gridlock. Slowly but surely, there were people buying and selling. But there were also other people that, that realized, look, I'm stuck in the middle of the city maybe I could just buy a car at the front of the queue that if we can leave, I could leave. I didn't have to wait. And so this proto-market developed. And this proto-market developed and suddenly the city realized, look, we lost contact with the rest of the world. We need to now do something. Like, where we? We need to survive. Like, we've already built a lot of infrastructure that allows us to survive in the current, like, world climate. Um, but we're going to have to do something very drastic very quickly. And so the city essentially wanted to order everyone to move, like, move their cars back home in order to open up infrastructure so that they could actually rebuild the city in time to sustain themselves. And that's when the people that bought into this proto car market said, wait, 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 you're telling us we, we need to now give up this market that we created. We're not going to do that. But what they then decided to do is they, they decided we're to build a lobby group to lobby the city and say, look, um, what, we're, what we want to do is we can formalize this car market, but we'll turn it into a commons. And this sort of proto uh, bill of legislation was called Cars as Common Tax Initiative or unintentionally ironic uh, cacti. Um, and so they asked the city, look, we can turn this into a formalized market. It will be a commons. We will, we will run this as a cost, but keep the car market. And we will then use this to fund the public infrastructure that we need, build more sustainable infrastructure to survive, build some protections in, and also like fund initiatives to sort of give hope to the city. And that's how the gridlock started. Um, it was due to this chaotic event that happened. And then suddenly, as we've seen that happen in the rest of the world, there could be cases of market capture. And those that have market power then lobby the governments to keep their power. Um, and so that's how the gridlock started or the origins of the gridlock. Now, there are some technical components here that I thought it was interesting to quickly, briefly touch upon. Um, it's, 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 the gridlock itself or the public car market on the gridlock is run through a what's called the Council of Random Seven. Um, and it uses from cryptograph cryptography, it uses a concept called Randau. And there's seven institutions or council members that are elected like judges. Um, and in order for them to collude on this public market, all seven have to collude together. Um, and then this they produce a random number such that it orders transactions in a distributed ledger or a blockchain every few seconds. And this sort of system just generally tries to ensure that there's some sense of fairness and avoids the likelihood of people sort of front running a buy from other people. Um, 
I think with cost in general, there's there's a lot of questions about like how the the fact that everything's always on sale. How do we deal with the fact that things can be suddenly bought from someone else when they were unaware, right? Because usually uh, in, in most transactions that are not auction based, um, there's an agreement before the sale takes place. So there were just some processes that try to ensure that this happens appropriately. Now here's what, where it gets interesting over time. Um, the, over time, the gridlock started evolving in, in, in unique capacities. Um, people could buy and sell these cars, but uh, due to the nature of the city and the sudden chaos that happened, um, people actually started living in these cars. Um, they, there were apartments that, that, that still ran on the usual private property model. And then you had these cars in the commons, but people started using these cars to, to live in. And uh, they started building homes in them. Uh, they started uh, building sort of temporary structures around them. They started building restaurants in these cars in, in the middle of the city, this new commons, this new public space, this unintentional pu emergent public space. Uh, they even started building temporary structures around them, you know, building homes or like caravans or RVs and building structures around them to sort of emergent behavior, coffee shops, libraries, um, internet cafes, just like anything you imagine that would be in a city, people built around these cars. But there was like a rule essentially that when the common, when this, this gridlock started, that the, you could buy and sell these cars um, and you could build additional structures around it, but it was only allowed to be temporary. Um, in other words, uh, when someone bought a car from you, you had to pull down the temporary structures. But as we all know, as we've seen in the past, when some when legislation like that exists, it's not necessarily always enforced um, to its best extent. And what started happening is people started buying and selling the temporary structures with the cars and then it slowly turned into permanent structures. The city tried to clamp down on these permanent structures by, by removing them. But what they realized is, unfortunately, unfortunately and unfortunately, is that these temporary structures or permanent structures um, actually produced more value for the city and in turn produced more tax revenue. Um, and this is in a classic case, the, the argument for cost, which is you have to trade off the the, the ability for people to invest in their assets um, versus the value of it being a productive asset to be used by other people in society. And so eventually that too was formalized due to the immense tax revenue that could, that was coming into the city. And this was a unique structure where essentially anything above the car in the gridlock, like literally right above it would essentially fall under revenue that the car would own, uh, would earn. So if there's a restaurant above it or an apartment above it, the car owner would receive the revenue and then the car owner would then pay tax to the city council. And so in this case, new sort of districts or neighborhoods were born. One is called the trunks and one is the mid-levels. What is the trunks? So the trunks comes from, you know, the boot of the car, if you're using Commonwealth language, Commonwealth English, it is the sort of underground of the city that eventually formed because people started building above the cars. You had this new tunnels or like streets that started getting closed up. So the trunk started becoming the sort of the new underground of the city where sort of more um, questionable activities started happening in the city. Um, and then obviously on top of it, you have the mid levels and the mid level essentially is new district that was built in the middle of the city between the skyscrapers above the streets. And the name, the mid levels comes actually from the mid levels in Hong Kong, um, where they, the people built these escalators halfway between the, the skyscrapers going up on Hong Kong Island. And that was like very good inspiration for me to imagine that. The other picture you see here is from Cairo, um, where, the city started building these um, highways between the skyscrapers. Now, it's not exactly highways, but I, I thought it's like a very good image to describe what I imagined. The skyscrapers would be closed up and there would be two districts, like a new layers of districts started starting to, to happen. 
So that's where the grid, that's where the city evolved to. Um, the the mid levels and these trunks started growing as new districts. There's new economic boom happening. Um, there's this concern over policing in the trunks because now they're suddenly sort of uh, not vi as visible as much anymore from <clears throat> the rest of the city. Um, but there was also this interesting play between those that lived in these commons and those that still lived in apartments or homes because those structures, those um, structures didn't follow the cost model, it's still private property. And so this is common, this is um, constant back and forth between the sort of uh, the, the people that can afford private property and those that still have to live in the commons. There's this dual system in the city. And the gridlock still continues to fund public infrastructure. Uh, it funded things like a new dome to protect the city from more harsh climate change. Uh, it does things like fund um, <clears throat> the Council of Random Seven, which, which is the public infrastructure, uh, things like the MEC Institute, which uh, was tasked to build technology for the city to sort of um, find answers. And the core part of this novel is that the city also funds what's called the Hope Runner Championship. And part of the belief of the gridlock or original point of lobbying was this to say, look, this is now our common destiny. Like we're only going to survive if we work together on this. And that's where the cost model tries to also represent the theme of, of this is something that we work on together in some sense at a self-sacrifice to ourselves to work together for a future goal, including this Hope Runner Championship. We want the gridlock to fund hope for the city such that we, we can build a sustainable city, but also hopefully eventually leave and figure out what happened to the rest of the world. Why were we alone? Why, was, why did the world disappear? Um, and so the Hope Runner Championship, essentially every five years, the city funds it's a, a new euro to it's in its championship, much like you could imagine, like the a, a voluntary Hunger Games, uh, to some extent, where uh, a champion is selected through these trials to venture into this horizon out from the city to discover the answers. And so, you have this vision of this person in this mech suit running into the desert, into the sunset, following this like sort of shimmering river of cars uh, to find answers for the city. Um, now, the gridlock itself, people uh, have still some concerns about it, how it functions in, in society. There's still sort of a concept of fairness um, now that it also includes homes and businesses. Um, initially, when the tax rates were set, it was set such that it was only cars and people weren't going to have built homes and businesses in it. So is, is the tax rate sufficient for people to live in it and build productive assets? There's also questions about the preparedness of the populace. Um, the poor doesn't necessarily have much, as much time to think and time to update the prices frequently. Um, there's also key questions about different powers in the city that tries to exploit this public car markets for their own benefits. And that's actually a key theme of the story um, uh, that sort of reveals their, these kind of different institutions that tries to manipulate this for their own personal gain. It's like, because you now suddenly have a market which is always online and always available um, and people don't necessarily have a choice to participate in this market, um, it, it, it is ripe for exploitation, exploitation and some capability. Um, there's also consist, cons, consistently questions about what it should fund. Um, you know, some people believe that the Hope Runner Championship is pointless. Like every five years, they send someone out to die, like because no Hope Runner has ever returned, right? That's core part of the story. And like, what should the tax rates be? Like there's people still debating that consistently. And so that's sort of where the, the point of the, the, the story actually begins. The story actually begins when you know, this is how the world exists today. There's this future city. They've been wanting to look for answers. There's this gridlock that exists in this world and they're trying to find answers. Um, and the, the, they've been funding this Hope Runner every five years, but none of them ever return. It's, it feels like a pointless endeavor. But for a lot of people, 
they still believe, they still believe that there's hope that exists outside the city, hope exists in the city. And the story starts essentially where one of these hope runners eventually return. And then it sets off this whole new sudden chaos and discovery and interesting events in the city when, when they built the city for this hope and one of them eventually returned hopefully with answers. But if you want to know what's going to happen, I implore you to read the book when it's available. Um, so yeah, the, the actual novel is about this near future city whose hope relies on its gridlock to fund its future. And in it, a young woman gets an unexpected opportunity to find answers she's always had since she was a child. What happened to her father and what happened to earth? And so it follows a cast of characters throughout the city as this discover hidden truths about the nature of it including things like the meaning of belonging, hope, power, and truth. And um, uh, it's definitely been an exciting process. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I haven't written an odd novel before, and um, it's now a year later, and I'm still writing. I'm busy with revisions, but I'm very excited. I, I feel like at least at the end of the day, I, I, I enjoyed working on this. You know, as you can see, like, it was a fun process to invent this fictional city. It, it was a fun process to invent this fictional gridlock. Uh, it was fun to invent how people would use this gridlock. You know, there are scenes where there's like coffee shops. Um, there's scenes where there's libraries built into these cars. Um, and that was just the fun part of it. It was fun for me to live that world. And I hope I can get to share that as well with you uh, in the future. Um, so that's... That's sort of the gist of the, the talk part of my, of my presentation. Um, uh, this is actually the first time I'm showing the cover to people. Um, I'm super happy with it. Uh, I'm just really excited to share the story one day. So the next part is I'm gonna get to the Q&A and then um, uh, respond to some questions. But let me just uh, stop sharing my screen. Um, cool. Uh, there's two there's questions here that I can touch upon. Um, cool. Let's start with the first question. Writing this novel, did you learn new things about the cost mechanism? Um, I think because okay, so just to just to touch base about some of the previous work I did um, I, in March for the first Radical Exchange Conference, <clears throat> I created a art project called This Artwork is Always on Sale. And it is a art project where it's a it's a NFT crypto collectible artwork which follows the cost model and the the tax rate is what I call a patronage rate and me as the artist earns from this artwork. And it has been on sale for a year and a half almost now. Um, and I recently launched a new version of the project and during that time, I did a lot of thinking about the cost mechanism, um, including things like tax rates and different scenarios, because the, the cost model usually tries to focus on things that are in real life applications, um, or at least like tries to, to, to change um, what already exists. Things like, let's look at how we do productive assets in society or do a commons or intellectual property, different things, but a artwork, as a crypto collectible was different to what was before. And so you, ha you had to do thinking about things of what would the, the tax rate be. Um, so I did a lot of thinking then and for the novel, um, I think just because a lot of people when they, when they read about costs, they have a lot of these questions about like the concept of fairness, um, like sh who should be able to, to, to sort of live under these conditions. Um, and so just, I wanted to point that out as well. You know, it's like, there are these questions that people ask, like, like what is the burden of, of requiring people to update their prices consistently? What would that burden be? Um, and, and would there be sort of a difference between like the rich who could maybe pay, pay analysts to keep their prices out of reach from other people such that they um, keep the asset, but obviously pay a higher taxes to like, a poorer person that doesn't necessarily have the time to think about their prices. Um, so I did learn some new things um, um, and I wanted to showcase that um, in the novel. Um, but it, but, but there, there's a section in the novel 
where they debate tax rates. Um, and so um, I try to I try to bring forth this the own my own thinking about these problems and put it forth to the reader. Um, cool. Another question: When is it being released? And am I thinking of doing a graphic novel version? Um, so when is it being released? Uh, I I have never written a novel before, um, so it's difficult for me to decide how long this might take to uh, get to to release, but. I'm busy with revisions at the moment. Um, and then the next step would be to, once this revision is done, uh, get it to an editor. I've given previous versions of the book to beta readers and they've given me extremely valuable feedback. So thank you to those that have read it already. Um, uh, but I'm still hoping somewhere in 2020. Uh, I definitely still want to release it somewhere this year, but given the state of the world, I'm, some things have also been delayed to some extent, but somewhere this year, if not early next year, um, the graphic novel version that would be super exciting. I just, I, I, I just love the idea of giving some parts of the book to to illustrators and saying, just invent what you see. And that's what the 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 first the the cover was a similar thing. The 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 illustrator is Dale Halforsen uh, from Cape Town, and. He said he wanted he wanted like freedom to design it. I'm like, please go ahead, read the read the beta copy and imagine what you think this cover would be. And I, and I just got only gave him like certain small tips. Um, and so that's what the novel came to be. And I would really love to do a graphic novel version, hopefully in the future, uh, or at least maybe a prequel or a, or a sequel. Cool from Mateo. Hi, Simon. Do you think gridlock and cost applied to houses would be facilitated by regionalization of PAA and larger family nucleuses, uh, co-ops as bidders? Um, that's a very interesting idea. Um, that's a very interesting idea. Uh, larger family nucleuses, because uh, bundling, right? So bundling as a concept of cost uh, is also something that touched upon in academic literature. Um, but bundling does also exist in the gridlock because what people do is they buy, say, three or four cars and then they build like a temporary structure around it and that's their home. Or they, they buy like, say, six cars in the, the gridlock and then build a coffee shop in it. Like they've literally built it on top of it. Or like if it's a, a bus, you can build, there's a scene where there's like a bus and these, these characters eat ramen, but it's like a double-decker bus so they can see the world around them. Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's cool. I think it's something I think maybe I can sneak into the book somewhere to touch upon what, what this looks like and um, uh, sort of the concept of people building regionalizations or, or co-ops uh, and, and, then, and then bidding together. Um, I'll definitely think about that more. Thanks, Matteo. So from Fanny. Um, what is happening with the artworks always on sale that you presented last year? Right, so I briefly touched upon that um, just now, but I could speak upon that more. Um, for over, uh, it, it, the first vision I launched in March, 2019, and it has always been on sale for since then. Um, a patron bought it um, a, just briefly during that time, the previous radical exchange conference and set the price to, um, like 240 ether, which generally fluctuated to like several thousand dollars. Um, but this patron kept it for basically the whole year. Um, and so from that, me as the artist, I got patronage from it, which has been uh, very valuable um, for me, but also valuable in terms of the experiment. Um, there was a team that took some of these ideas and started building what's called wild cards. And I think they presented during the conference as well, some parts of it, some of the members. And wild cards uses this model for conservation of animals. So you buy this collectible animal and parts of the patronage goes towards the conservation of this, this animal. Um, and during that time, they actually discovered some, some sort of medium severity bugs in the code that I wrote. Um, and that gave me the opportunity, luckily no funds were at risk, but that gave me the opportunity to like a month ago to just revisit the code. So I went back, I, I recoded the, the website. Um, I, I recoded it from scratch. I fixed the bugs and then I launched a version two actually on Friday. So um, there's now a new artwork available um, 
that has these fixes in it. Um, but there's one thing that I changed, which is um, the first version had a patronage rate of 5%, um, and the new one has a patronage rate of 100%. Now, as we know from cost literature, if you increase the patronage rate, um, it increases the turnover, not, sorry, I call it patronage rate because people sometimes have like this mental block to paying taxes, but it's a tax rate. So when you increase the tax rate, um, it has this sort of the, uh, a downwards effect on the price, and this will in turn increase the turnover of the asset. In this case, the collectible artwork. What I wanted to see was uh, how, how this could relate to artworks or collectible artworks in general. So. 5% meant that the artwork, the original artwork did not turn over in a year. Um, I want to see what it's like if this artwork turns over more frequently. And so I set a 100% um, tax rate. Um, <clears throat> the one benefit to 100% tax rate is that you have to do less mental accounting to what you will have to pay in a year. Um, so uh, if you put the price as say 10 ether, you will pay 10 ether over a year um, versus if it's 5% or 15%, you have to do some mental calculation to figure out what should your deposit be. Um, the next question is, are you in vibe with wildcards? Um, as I said before, uh, I just mentioned wildcards um, as a way to use cost to preserve endangered species. Um, the team, much of the team members are also from Cape Town, um, where I'm from, um, and we've been in touch since they started. Uh, they started the project at ETH Cape Town, the hackathon here in Cape Town, um, using the code that I wrote. And we've been in touch back and forth talking about a lot of these things. They've done an incredible job improving sort of the technical scaling parts of building things like this to getting the conversation uh, out into different industries about the usage of this model. Um, I call it uh, patronage markets. So it's like essentially, um, assets as a patronage, assets as patronage. Um, and uh, I still talk to them frequently and try to help where I can. But, you know, they've, they've taken this idea much further than I have, and I'm extremely grateful for them for pushing the conversation further. Um, another question from Matteo. Um, how would you think cost would be applicable to intellectual property? Um, I have thought about this a lot and I need to like jog my memory again on what my feelings are. I think there's a lot of interesting application for it. Um, there's a lot of people that have written about it. People like Matthew Pruitt, who is uh, with the Radical Exchange. Um, people like Stephen Mackey um, have also written about it. Um, uh, Luke Duncan has, has also written about it. I think I think it would come down to what kind of intellectual property. For example, Luke Duncan proposed this this model where uh, you you look at open source as a as intellectual property, where um, you are allowed to to um, what's the word to to sort of exclude intellectual property from the open source movement and exploit it in a private capacity if you pay the license for that code or due to a cost model. You have to value, you have to value the, the intellectual property such that it's excluded from public. Um, and that in turn could like fund more open source, right? If you don't want to continue excluding it from the, from the public, then it just becomes open source. Um, and so there's this interchange with people saying, I want to exploit this for private use. Let me make, let me exclude it from the commons and in turn pay cost back to the people. Um, but it's different to things like um, artwork. Uh, it's different to things like, what if I do in my novel? You know, my novel was this kind of intellectual property. What if someone can buy my revenue, re revenue rights from this novel? Um, so there's still a lot of interesting questions around that. There's also, I think Matthew Pruitt also put it well. He said like there's a difference between, in cost between uh, what's regarded as um, sort of, uh, I forgot the words that he used, but essentially the difference between um, something that came from your mind and like something that's a real world asset out there. 
Um, in I, I did write a lot about sort of usage of this in 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 the arts, but to explain like. Um, we do have this concept that whatever is produced by people's minds, like intellectually, like it comes into public use eventually, like in copyright, music copyright, something eventually becomes public domain or any copyright for that matter. Uh, you know, this is anything that's created eventually becomes public domain. So you can have this interplay between using cost that doesn't necessarily have to use this model that it's like it's only privately exploitable for this period and then when a person dies plus so many years then it becomes in public domain you could have a mixture much sooner where it could just naturally go into the public domain when there's no more interest in it being privately exploitable anymore so i think there's still a lot of questions and i hope people still keep asking those questions cool um another question uh, I still have 10 minutes left, but I pro should probably finish sooner unless there's more questions. Um, are you planning on consulting with more blockchain companies on cost? Um, at the moment, um, I'm not actively consulting um, around this model. I do believe it's still very interesting and I do want to see more usage of it, at least to continue asking questions about where it could be used. Um, and to answer a previous question around what I learned um, around using costs for this novel, um, in some cases it's just it's it's it might seem like a good idea, but 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 it's not because like things like brand names, for example, brand names or or anything to do with naming um, has value due to its 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 it's it's a like very one-on-one -on -one attachment to a specific institution or entity that if you if you suddenly remove a brand from somewhere it like loses all it it, it could lose all its value um and so that's maybe questionable should we do brands with this model or not um uh so in general i'm planning consulting not at this moment but i do think there's a lot of so interesting questions to ask um and i do if anyone is building anything related to this stuff to please just get in contact at least uh, allows me to see what's going on um and so i think that is the last question currently from the audience um so unless there's more questions i think that's that's my time um thank you very much for joining me and i hope to share what i wrote somewhere this year and i hope you read it and enjoy the world that i created i uh, thank you very much for